Welcome back. This is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today we're going to talk about magnesium, the forgotten mineral. Oftentimes when we talk about minerals, we often think about calcium. Calcium from bone health, osteoporosis, and so forth. Magnesium is kind of a missing piece when it comes to mineral uptake. So let's go into how we discover if we have magnesium deficiency. Now, when they look for magnesium in your regular blood work, it says magnesium, that's serum magnesium, and that's not a great indication of what your magne magnesium levels are. If you're going to check for magnesium, you want to check it in the red blood cell magnesium. That would give you a better read of what's going on. Also, with magnesium, there are a lot of little subtle clinical signs that might indicate you have magnesium deficiency. So we'd like to go over some of the signs and symptoms, and then we'll go into what forms might be the best and what I use in my office to help patients, okay? So essentially, <clears throat> mineral, uh, essential mineral, which is a cofactor in over 300 enzymatic processes or reactions, right? It's involved in protein synthesis, muscle contraction, nerve function, blood pressure, hormone binding, and other things. There's a lot of them, right? Because there's over 300 enzymatic processes that magnesium is involved in. Now, some clinical signs and symptoms of deficiency. Muscle cramping, usually at night. Sleep disturbances. Stress and anxiety, right? You feel wired and tired and you know, highly stressed, right? High blood pressure is also another clinical sign. And then you're gonna have constipation for some people because you need magnesium for muscle uh, motility and, and contraction in the colon. And then you could have some people who have fatigue, heart palpitations, or some people who have AFib or atrial fibrillation, cognition, and then headaches, things like migraine and so forth. So there are a lot of little clinical signs and tips here of a possible magnesium deficiency. Now, when we look at the different forms of magnesium, there are a lot of them. And let's just go into some of what the research says, okay, in terms of magnesium. So there's magnesium aspartate, it's 42 to 45% absorption, right? And absorption primarily occurs in the small intestine and partially in the colon or the large intestine. So magnesium aspartate has 42% the 45% absorption rate. The reason I don't use it is because aspartate is an ex excitatory neurotransmitter. So the purpose of magnesium is to kind of calm things down, to rest, to relax, and so forth. But if you combine it with aspartate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, then you're kind of um, having the um, push and pull of an opposite effect when it comes to magnesium. Another one is magnesium uh, lactate, it's 42% absorption. Magnesium citrate is 30% absorption, and usually very good for people who have constipation, right? Magnesium citrate. There's magnesium glycinate, which is a 24% absor absorption rate. And the reason I like magnesium glycinate is because glycine is a precursor to GABA, right? And GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so it calms things down. So you have a calming effect of glycine, and then you have the calming effect of magnesium, which has a profound effect, not just the effect of 24% absorption, but a clinical outcome effect. You have magnesium chloride, is 20% absorption. We like to use that when we have people who have low stomach acid issues, because chloride is used in hydrochloric acid, so you can use that for people who have maybe some low stomach acid issues or reflux issues. And then you have magnesium sulfate. It's only 47% absorption rate, right? They've actually used magnesium sulfate in studies for atrial fibrillation. And they actually had pretty good outcome with it. And they used a form that's not even highly absorbable. And it still had some clinical outcome that was positive. They also use magnesium oxide, which is a 4% absorption rate in some other studies. 
And even magnesium oxide, which has a 4% absorption rate, still has some positive outcome in the studies. So the half-life of magnesium is about 1,000 hours. So you don't have to necessarily take magnesium every day, right? You can dose up uh, in two, three days a week. But um, what's important is how do we use it, right? How do we use it in our office? We have all, this, all these numbers and statistics of how you can use magnesium or the absorption rate, but in clinical practice, how do we use it? In my office, we like to use magnesium glycinate. Like I said, glycine has an inhibitory effect on GABA, right? So, I mean, glycine is a precursor to GABA. Therefore, you have an inhibitory effect on your nervous system along with magnesium. So if we want to just a general use in our office, we'll use magnesium glycinate, right? It's, it's a great way to have a calming effect. Magnesium citrate is for patients who we have constipation. So if have some constipation issues, until we can work some things out to help improve constipation, we may use magnesium citrate to get the bowels moving, right? The one we like to use for brain or sleep is magnesium theonate right in here. This has a great effect on the nervous system, right? Particularly the NMD receptors for the nervous system because magnesium theonate can cross the blood brain barrier, right? It doesn't just work on muscle tissue or etc., but it crosses the blood brain barrier and has a neurological effect. So magnesium theonate uh, is a great one for that. So I tend to use these three in our office. Now, there are other forms that are good also, like magnesium uh, malate, you can use magnesium chloride. But at the end of the day, you know, we don't have you know, 50 different supplements for magnesium, but we can use these three in conjunction to help patients with their health conditions. Now, there are companies out there that will use a combination. They'll use magnesium theonate, glycinate, and maybe malate uh, to help, or even citrate. So you can use a combination of for formulation for magnesium, which can have a pretty good outcome. Now, we use a lot of magnesium theonate for people with anxiety, uh, maybe even depression, or even ADD, ADHD. So it's a great form of using uh, to help calm the nervous system. Overall, magnesium is needed, right? At the end of the day, we are deficient. Uh, I believe the RDA is somewhere on like 350. Um, but for most people who uh, take in magnesium from diet, etc., they're significantly deficient, even for RDA. So what we like to do in terms of dosing for patients is this. <clears throat> we know most patients are deficient, and RDA is just under 400. So we would like to dose at, at between 200 to 400 milligrams at night. So it has a calming effect at night, deeper sleep, better sleep means overall health improvement and healing, right? So we can use this as a starting point. And sometimes I've gone as high as 1,000 milligrams of magnesium, especially things like magnesium theonate when we're trying to affect the brain and have a profound effect. But you have to kind of play with this, these numbers, right? Because you can't just go ahead and say, I'm going to take 1,000. You might have loose stool, even if you're taking like magnesium glycinate, right? You can still get loose stool, so you got to be careful. Um, overall, you don't have any many, many side effects with this. Uh, you can use it with a lot of these medications, heart drugs, and so forth. I think there's some cardiologists out there would, who would agree with that. Um, so you can use magnesium uh, with even some of these medications out there. But you know, always ask your physician. You know, if you're on you know ten different medications, you always want to ask your physician uh, whether it's, it's safe to take, okay? My name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results, and we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.